Simone, um, let's talk a bit about your, your life. You were born where and when? I was born in Egypt, 1948. And uh, can you tell me a bit about your parents, your father, your mother, a little... They were originally from where? They, they were born in Egypt? My, my parents uh, were born in Egypt. My grandparents, I think they came from Turkey. And uh, their ancestors came from Spain. So at, at home, at my, at my home, we spoke French because this is, was the current la language in, Egypt, in Cairo. And in my, in my mother's house, I remember it was the Ladino, which is Spanish. Um, and what about, what about your, your father's family? They, from, they were from where? My father's family, the same thing. They were from Turkey. Originally, originally they came from Spain as well, the time of the Inquisition. So both sides, they spoke uh, Ladino, more than Arabic. Like um, the, we had Syrians and Lebanese Jewish in Egypt as well. They spoke Arabic, but in our family we spoke fr French and, uh, and and Spanish. Uh, your grandfather was, you said, from Turkey. Uh, Smyrna is the the, the city. Bo both grandparents came from Smyrna. In Turkey. Okay. I, I lived in, in, in Cairo. Yes. Uh, f for the first nine years of my life. Yes. I went to the, to the French school, Lycée Francais, and um, my, uh, my brother as well, Michel, and we went to Lycée Francais, which was the, the normal school for most of the, the, the people, the Jews living in Cairo. Uh, you, were, you were obviously there during the time of King Farouk. Yeah, King Farouk, I don't remember. I remember being told about King Farouk. King Farouk was apparently very friendly with the Jews. And he was, um, he liked the good life, so he went to restaurants and he was always um, meeting people. Um, so tell me a little bit now, uh, your, your father, um, what did he do for a living? Your father? My father, I, re uh, I, I was told, during the war, the war he had a, a photographic shop. And uh, when, uh, during the war, uh, we, we had uh, uh, British troops in Egypt, in, in, Ca in Cairo. And my father and my father mixed with them. They were like, uh, his clients, and this is the reason why he spoke relatively good English. What kind of business? His fa my grandfather was um, he had a factory, uh, mirrors. He made mirrors. He was very very rich. Uh, he had uh, even uh, he had some buildings. He owned some buildings. And he was, uh, and my uncle, Eli, was uh, his partner. They were very wealthy. Uh, what was Cairo like at that time? It must have been very hot. What kind Ca of... Cairo was, it was hot in summer, but uh, most of the year was, the temperature was very mild and never rained. The nine years that I lived there, I didn't see one drop of rain. And um, blue skies. The, the life, the, the, the social life, was very intense. The Jewish community uh, took advantage on, of, the, of the climate, of the, the good weather, and uh, they used to go out a lot, you know, open-air restaurants, uh, open-air uh, uh, places over the, the Nile, you know, very beautiful places. And um, the reason, and the life at night was very intense because as it was hot, the shops used to close uh, for lunch time. And everyone went home and had a rest, had a nap. Siesta. Yes, uh, la sieste in French. And uh, so uh, the, the, the day really, 
was uh, uh, start the night started early, and um, people used to take advantage. They didn't have to get up very early, and most of the night I remember my parents going out all the time, and sometimes they took us as well. We used to go out to uh, open air cinemas. Uh, we had a place, a fav our favorite place. The name it was Groppi. Groppi. It was very, very famous. King Farouk apparently liked very much to go there. Yeah, I, I, everyone in in, uh, in Cairo at that at that time knew Groppi and Gro Gro and um, it was a very nice place. And we had a very good life. We were uh, rich. We had maids. We had. Uh, we had a cook, we had people to, 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 to do the laundry and to press. We traveled two months a year. We went to Alexandria. Most of the Jewish community did this. You know, we, they, we rented a house in Alexandria and, and spent the two hottest months of Cairo, which was, um, we, we went to, the, holi the school holidays were from August to October, so as soon as the holiday started, we used to go to the beach and, and spend the time there. Uh, very happy life, uh, very good food. Uh, we had a good life in Egypt. The Jews were very, very happy, and apparently uh, they didn't have any anti-Semitism. Even though what I remember, from what my mother was saying, that she she felt that there was, even though it wasn't a, a parent, and I think maybe because of the king, Farouk, who was very friendly with the Jews, but uh, my mother could feel that uh, there was anti-Semitism, anti and uh, her idea of leaving Egypt was very strong. Even though I don't think my father was considering ever the idea, but eventually we had to leave when when uh, Nasser took over the the power. So you're you're saying when even before Nasser, uh, there was anti-Semitism even even the time of Farouk. My mother, my mother felt it with the with the the Arabs, you know, the population. Uh, she she said that uh, she heard things about, you know, talking about her being a Jew. Anyway, she wasn't very comfortable, but this was her idea, and this is what she she passed to us. But as a child as well, I never heard anything like this, really. She tells me something interesting as well. In, in 1952, there was a manifestation in downtown, this is where we used to live as well, very close to where we live. And 400 buildings were set fire. People, uh, mostly Jewish buildings. So we, it was starting uh, subtly, but it was starting this uh, uh, pursuit against the Jews. My mother was scared. She, she said yeah. that she was in a big shop with me, which was burned, hmm. and, and she took me and she rushed me home. They took a taxi, and, and it was a very, really big event in Cairo. Uh, not that I remember. I was very small, but I heard of it. Yeah, 400 buildings is not so subtle. 400 buildings is not so subtle, is it's it? not so subtle, <laughs> and uh, it was very near from where we lived. I never liked where we lived downtown, you know. Hmm. This awful buildings, never, I, I was never comfortable in, in, in the place where we lived. I liked, I liked Heliopolis, which was a, a suburb where my, my uh, the parents, my, the relatives of my mother lived. My uh, aunt Esther and my aunt Regine used to have a, an apartment there. And the weekends we used to go there, me and Michelle, my brother to spend the weekend there, so I loved it there. It was more like rural. My my uncle Eli and his wife um, my Mary and his family lived in Zamalek, which was supposed to be a very, very posh place, and I loved it. The only houses, very quiet. There was this... Um, uh, I think it was built by the English. It was 
it was called the Garden City. So the design of the building was English. But I didn't like to leave downtown, but we, we lived there. And so when, um, when did it start getting really complicated for the, the Jewish population in Egypt? In 1956, October 1956, I remember we were coming home from an outing. We were out at night and uh, we heard sirens, the sirens. And this is when the war was declared. This war was the, uh, the war of the Suez Canal. It was against Egypt, against um, Israel, mostly, and then the British and the French were participate of the, the war. So we heard the sirens, we went, I, I remember vividly, we went home and uh, this is the first time that we really noticed that something wrong was happening. And after this, for some time, my, I had my, the, all the relatives of my mother, my uncles and aunt, uh, Niso, Mirabel, Eli, Eliezer, my aunt Regine, uh, Fofo, everyone that lived in the suburb, they had to come to they were living in my apartment for, I, I, I don't know, I, I had the idea of, I have the idea that it was during a month or more when uh, you had bombardments and you had sirens and I remember the, we had to cover the windows, make sure at night not to have any lights on. Blackout. Blackout. And... Um, I wasn't scared because I was a child, I was enjoying the situation, but this is w when it started. And after this, this is when Nasser took power and he was completely against the Jews. He wanted to get rid of all the Jews and all the foreigners. So we were expelled. We, we had to sell uh, the apartment, we had to sell most of the, the furniture, and we were allowed to to take very little with us, like uh, mainly clothes and things like this. Not the jewel, uh, you, you have to you had to leave all the jewelry, all the the paintings, everything. Well, you sold it. I mean, you didn't that leave was, it. That had value. I don't know if we we sold the the jewelry. Must the have. Of course. And, and the money, how did you get the money? You, you couldn't take the money out, so you had to... We couldn't take the money out. out. Yes, we couldn't take the money out. I, my, my parents, obviously, they sold the apartment. And what I know about as a child, uh, he, were, he was in charge of taking the money to Switzerland. And this is, this is what happened. This is how we got the money out. Now, about this... Uh, Business. I remember that my when we left Egypt, we went to Switzerland, of course, to collect the money. And apparently, this guy didn't want to give us the money back. He wanted to keep the money. So it was a very difficult situation. Finally, my uncle Salomon and my and my father they got their money back. Why did you go to Brazil? You had an opportunity to go to Australia. Yeah, you know, when 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 the uh, Nazi took took over, it was clear that you if you were were a Jew, you couldn't stay in Cairo. There was no way you could stay. So people started to go whatever they could. A lot of people went to Israel. They didn't have anyone to call them or something like this. We were very lucky. We had an uncle in Brazil. I don't know if they had contact with him. They maintained contact because this uncle, uh, uh, Alberto, he had left Brazil when he was 17, and I think apparently 1923. And he came to Brazil, and he he established himself here. He got married to Tia Teresa, and uh, he became rich here. Yeah. And after us came other the other part of the family, my my father's part of the family, mostly his cousins. Not uh, his, his one of the brother, unc uh, uh, uncle, uh, uncle Lee went to the States, and uh, my, my, the two, his two sisters, 
uh, Esther and, and uh, Suzanne went to Australia because they had a brother that was, li was living in Australia for a long time. He was already established there. So we came to Brazil and my, I, the, the, the cousins of my, uh, my father, uh, Ralph, and his wife Kiki, with the, his mother, Tante Mathilde, Joconda and uh, Simon, and Michel at the time, uh, Maris was born in Brazil. And uh, eventually we had as well uh, some distant cousins of my, my father, uh, Uncle Joe and his wife Sarah and his son Jacques. Uh, they came to Brazil two or three years after we arrived there and they stayed in our place for about a month or so. Like uh, my, my, my uh, uncle, Tio Alberto, did this for us. So everyone that arrived from, from Egypt, every family, uh, went to his place and we were received there by his wife, very sweet lady, Tia Teresa. And we stayed there for uh, over a month until we could settle and rent an apartment and and move. Um, just tell me, just be, uh, tell me a little bit about the, the, how the trip was. You know, you left you left Egypt. We left and Egypt. And you took a, you took a ship to 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 Europe. I mean, where did you from where? Yeah, how did we, that go? We we when we left Egypt, we we um, traveled to the, in two t different ships. Uh, First, we took a ship from uh, Alexandria and we went to Europe. We went to France, Marseille, to visit my uncle, my un uh, uncle Niso and his wife Mirabel and my cousin Jacques. They were in France, very poor, didn't have, because when, when people left Egypt, they left everything. We were lucky to take some money, but most of the, the people didn't. So we, we stayed in a, in a hotel where they were living. They were living in a hotel. And we stayed there for about two weeks. And then we went to Switzerland to collect this money. And then uh, eventually we went to, to Italy, uh, to Geneva, uh, from where we were supposed to take the... the Transatlantic that took us to Brazil. It was. Uh, it wasn't even. It was. It wasn't even finished building. So we had to wait in a hotel in in Geneva, and the hotel was very near from the 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 docks. The docks, and uh, we could see the the ship being finished. The last arrangement for the ship to be ready. The name of this this ship was. Uh, Cabo de São Roque. Apparently, it was very big, very luxurious. It was a really luxurious uh, transatlantic. And uh, we traveled, I think, for two or three weeks until we, we arrived in, in Rio. In Rio, we stayed, I remember, in a very cheap hotel in an awful place near the docks. My mother was very depressed, and uh, because we uh, we had to come to São Paulo, and we took we came to São Paulo by bus. And I remember my unc uncle, Tio Alberto, uh, receiving us at the station bus station, and I remember vividly. I don't know if I if it's real or not, but I remember him coming up into the bus and welcoming us. He was a very nice person, him and his wife, Tia Teresa, really, really nice people. And he made us very feel very comfortable and very welcome. Me and my brother, Michel, as children, we were delighted because we went to, he had a beautiful house. We never lived in a house, always in apartments in, in Egypt. So he had a house in Rua Tabapua. And um, we loved being there. It was a, a big house, and uh, we had a bedroom just for ourselves. 
he was really pleasant. Everything was different, everything was cheerful. He had a big family, Gio Alberto. So he had a daughter um, and a son, daughter-in-law, grandchildren, and many, many friends. So we were surrounded by, by a lot of people. As my parents spoke um, Spanish, I think they didn't have a great uh, difficulties with, with the language. So Remember the first school you went to? Uh, well, we, we rented, our first apartment was in Rua Barão de Limeira, in the, um, in the poor area in, in Sao Paulo. Downtown? Yeah, downtown. Now it's very downtown. We rented an apartment, one bedroom apartment first. And uh, I was enrolled in uh, school, me and, and Michelle. And uh, the, the name of the school was uh, Colegio Maria José, which was two or three blocks away from our flat. So we used to go, go walking. I remember the first, I don't remember the first day of school. I, I don't think I was very happy. But after a while, we started to speak the language, and it wasn't that bad. You know, I made, I made a friend. I remember I made a friend called Elsa. She was red hair. And um, I remember the first uh, exam I took was uh, history, Brazilian history. My father helped me, and uh, I got a six and a half out of ten, which was a good mark, you know, because I didn't speak the language so fluently but then yeah and, spe and especially um brazilian history which we weren't that familiar with yeah don pedro i remember don pedro and all this thing you know it was really i didn't understand what i was talking about but this is how it is <laughs> this is how i learned started to learn the brazilian history after this school you went to to went to another school after this school well, we, after a year or so, we, we, my father bought a, an apartment, two bedrooms apartment, Where? in the same street, opposite, Barão de Limeira. And um, we lived there until I was 15. Then, uh, well, when I was 15 years old, when Michel was 12, he, he moved to school. He went to the Colegio Rio Branco, which was a better school than Maria José, a bit further, but we, we he went by bus. And uh, eventually I went to the school as well when I was 15, to, for my high school years, three years. I spent three years in Colegio Rio Branco. And then eventually we moved to Alameda Santos. I was 15, so it was 1963. And... Um, we lived there, I lived there until I got married. Um, in in uh, Rio Branco you made friends as well, right? The first friend I, I made was Brazilian, was my friend Lucila. Up to now she's a friend of mine. So this was the first friend I made. My, my parents, they always had a lot of friends since we arrived in, in Egypt, in Brazil. Uh, most of the, the, the Jewish uh, people from Cairo that came to Brazil, they were friendly with my parents. So it, it was really like uh, the uh, transfer the friends from there to, to another country. But it was still the same atmosphere and we used to meet a lot of people and, and, and socialize with a lot of people. My, 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 uh, fr the, my mother had good friends, um, Vicky and uh, Cisa which were like sisters. And when they came to Brazil, so we, we, we were re reunited. I mean, they came in the same, in 57 as well. And they had children, and I was friendly with their children. And when, when and I went to, to Rio Branco, so I, I knew a lot of people. Uh, so, so what happened after, after you, um, you left school? Did you, what did you do then? After I left uh, school, uh, I didn't want to go to university. I thought I wasn't, I wasn't capable of taking this step. I don't know why. You weren't confident. I was not confident at all. 
So I, 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 I studied, I went, I studied English for a year. I used to, I loved English more than French. I studied English and then um, eventually I, I got a job. My, my father sort of obliged me to apply for a, for a job and uh, so I did. I wasn't very happy and I got my first and only job which was in Agencia Anglo-Americana. I uh, was renting apartments for foreigners, mostly English-speaking people. Uh, I wasn't very comfortable with my English, but I worked there during two years, and uh, it gave me confidence. You know? And after, I, after two years, I decided maybe it was time to, to try to get into university which I did. I, I took a year of studying, Cursinho, Cursinho Objetivo, I did, at Paulista Avenue, so I, I, I went walking, and I took this whole year to study. Uh, my, my, uh, this course was in the afternoon, so I, in the morning I studied, I was studying, the afternoon I was in this Objetivo, and at night I was studying ag again, and all this study was because I wanted to go to the public university, Universidade de São Paulo, USP, which, a part of being the best university, was free. And I thought uh, that for my parents would be good to not to have to pay five more years of, of tuition. So what happened is that uh, I, I just went for this university. I didn't even apply the other ones. I wasn't interested. And luckily enough, I, I, I went, I was approved. And uh, I had, I well, was... It, it wasn't luck. You, you, you I mean, <laughs> it wasn't luck. It was, it was, we, there was 70... Uh, applicants. Applicants. Yeah. No, there was thousands of applicants. And you had 70 uh students that were going to be accepted, accepted okay, yes. right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember I, I wasn't accepted. The, the first 70, I wasn't accepted. So the first list, I didn't get in. And I was in Guarujá, and this is interesting. I was in Guarujá, and I, okay, I didn't pass. What could I do? So one day in Guarujá, uh, this cousin of mine, Brazilian cousin, Dirce. She came and, and she congratulated me. Oh my God, you, you, you were accepted at USP. And I said, no, I wasn't. And she said, yes, you were. Buy the newspaper and see. So I bought the newspaper and I uh, realized that there was, I didn't even know, there was a second list. And this second list included four students and I was one of them. So from Guarujá, I rushed to Sao Paulo by myself to get all the, the procedures for the documents, you the documents to enroll the un university. So I spent the whole day in, in Sao Paulo. Uh, it was a lot of documents that I had to do and, and medical exams and things like this. And um, this is how I got in the in, uh, university. And uh, how long were you there for? Five years. Five years, a long, a long time. Uh, the university I made friends. I made a very good friend, Simone Weinberg. Eventually we went to, to Israel. We decided to go to Israel because there was uh, uh, the war of Yom Kippur. Uh, and uh, young Jews were called to, to help at the kibbutz in Israel, volunteers. So we decided to go. I stayed with my uh, with my cousin for four, and my my her husband Albert, my 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 cousins, um, the the three boys Jacques, Ariel, and um, Gilly. My friend was with her relatives as well. She wasn't very happy, and uh, we the purpose of our trip was to go to the kibbutz. So we went to the we eventually went to the kibbutz. She went 
one day before. She went on a Sunday and I went on the Monday. And she met Bernie there. He was a, a, in, a, a English boy as well, a volunteer in the kibbutz. And she bec they became friends. And then and he became friends with Simon. And so when I came there, it was nice to already be introduced to people. Every two uh, volunteers were given a room, hut, w uh, made of wood, very precarious, very... Uh, primitive. Primitive. Uh, but uh, to me, it was like a, a castle, because I was really happy to be on my own, with friends, with young people, away from my family, and uh, free to do whatever we wanted. So I was really, really, really happy. And this was the first time you you ever been away from home, wasn't it? Uh, the first time. The first time I was 25, and the first time I traveled by plane. Yeah, it was that very exciting. And so you, anyway, uh, um, what did you do in the kibbutz? So at the kibbutz, the volunteers, they could choose. They had to work because we were replacing the, the boy, all the boys and men that uh, went to the, to the war, to, to, as soldiers. Yeah. So what remained in the kibbutzes all, all over Israel were the, the old people and, and the women. And kibbutz, um, uh, like small cities, and uh, they produce things, and you have to work f to make things happen there. So we, we were allowed to choose whatever we wanted to do. I chose to, to work in the kitchen. So I went, uh, I, was, uh, I, I was supposed to prepare the chadarochel, which is the, the, the canteen where we had our me meals. I was supposed to, to prepare this chadarochel for breakfast and lunch. So basically I was working from 5 o'clock in the morning to 11. 5 o'clock in the morning it wasn't easy to get up, it was winter and very cold. But the good thing about it is by 11 I was free and I had the whole day to enjoy myself. So uh, Bernie chose to pick oranges. He, he went about eight, a bit later, eight, nine o'clock, because it was really cold. And by two o'clock, I think, no, but for lunch, he was already back. Simon chose to work with chickens. So she was out early as well and, and came back early. There's a story about uh, Simone and the chickens. She had a. She had, there was a guy there, an old, an old chap. Dumb. Dumb. His yeah, name dumb. was Dumb. Dumb. And <laughs> according to Simone, he fancied her, and uh, he was. He was quite he old. Was chasing her. Yes, of course he was old because to keep on in the kibbutz only old people, as I told you, and um, he was chasing her, and she was running away from here, and it was. A funny story, and uh, I think Bernie had has pictures, don't you? You have pictures yeah. of her. And um, anyway, after after everyone came back from from work, we used to uh, gather in one of the rooms, which was mostly Bernie's room, and he was all there. We, he had. Um, a kettle, of course, as a good Englishman, he had a kettle, and uh, he had uh, he had an improvised toaster made of I don't know it was a element element yes electric element electric element and uh, nothing to do with a toast but it made toasts and uh, it was nice because we used to had have hot tea and toast with butter and jam it was really nice. With all the, 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 the youngsters there. But they from where they were from all they over the world. They were from all over the over yeah, you had people from all over the, the world. You had a, we had a, a person from um, a young guy from Africa, 
which he said he was a prince or something like this. I don't know if we believed him or not, but this is what this was his story. We had a guy, a Canadian guy. He was a deserter, Vietnam War, and he spoke French. He spoke Canadian French, which I thought it was fake French, but apparently this is the French they speak in Quebec. Yeah, there was an American girl, uh, Sharon. Sharon. She was very outgoing and um, very talkative. She liked gossip. She liked gossip. She... Anyway, she was forward. You know, yeah. she was... She in, in, inadvertently showed that she had... Yeah, she inadvertently <laughs> showed that she had uh, pills. She was on the pills. She was on the pills. Which was a, a new thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, so she was funny. She was really funny. She was fun as well. So we... we there was a, a, a girl from Manchester, Paula, fat girl, and something really funny happened. During the, during the whole time that we were in the kibbutz, this was January to February, it poured with rain. But really, it was like, you know, my luck. My luck, it was like it hadn't been raining like this in the last 30 years. And so the kibbutz was flooded. And some days we couldn't even go to the Hadarochel, which was the, the canteen, the restaurant. And we had to be slapped by a tractor. But when we had to walk, we, it, it was really flooded. So we were under the water, we were walking on water. And one day we were walking, and uh, three of us, or four of us, and uh, Paul, Paula was one of them, very fat girl, and suddenly she disappeared. What happened is there was a hole on the ground. There was a bridge, actually, and she was... Oh, yes, we were crossing a bridge. We didn't even know. And <laughs> so she didn't... She wasn't on the bridge, so she went... The other side, when, where the where there wasn't any bridge, and she fell into the water. So suddenly she disappeared. This was funny. <laughs> but she came back up. Okay. Yeah, she came up. I wasn't prepared for the intense cold. Really, it was cold. And the, the, the good thing about the kibbutz is everything is, is everyone. So I went to a place. They had a lot of coats and things like this. Chose one, took it. And it was mine for the duration. We, ha we had an allowance as well, a yeah. bit of money they gave us. So on Friday or Saturday, we, we were allowed to go to a, a shop there. No, we, we, we got cigarettes, because it was the, f the fashion, smoking, and we got chocolate and sweet like this. It was fun. Yeah, it was their money. It wasn't real money. Oh, I don't, the, yeah, I don't remember. Yeah, it was. It was a it kibbutz was, money. It was okay, which can be converted. It, it, could, it be could be converted. So yeah. you got this once a week, and and you could spend it there. My my trip included France to Paris. From Paris, we went to Montpellier, which my cousin Jacques and his wife Monique were living. We wanted to visit, I wanted to visit, and Simone eventually came with me. And then we went to um, uh, Amsterdam and to, and to London. This was the, the, the what we, organi we had organized. It was all planned and set. So I, I had to leave the kibbutz uh, in, uh, on the 6th of February. And my first, our first stop was London which we were going to stay for five or six days. We had the hotels books and, uh, booked and everything. But he decided to, to leave the kibbutz and come to England with me, because by then he had proposed to me, and uh, he wanted to introduce me to his parents. And my idea was to go to England, being introduced, and go back eventually after the trip to Brazil. I didn't want to stay in England, and um, so 
what we arrange is if we wanted to get married, the one to move was Bernie. He, he would have to come to, to Brazil. Uh, mostly because I had to finish my university, but as well I was I was I was very immature. I wasn't really uh, bold enough to to start a new life in another country. So this was the arrangement, and he agreed. Apparently, he always thought that maybe one day he would leave England. I don't know why, because it's such a beautiful country. If I knew, I would really had moved with him but then he decided to come to Brazil and we were corresponding sending letters daily and for, during six months until the 24th of June when he arrived in Sao Paulo he arrived he left London on the 23rd of June he arrived on the 24th of June my my brother Michel and my father, we went to pick him up in Campinas. This was the, the, the international airport, Viracopos. And uh, there he was, a light blue suit and uh, very handsome. And uh, my father, when he met him, he was introduced, I introduced him to my father, my father gave him a hug and apparently he was a bit shocked because as an Englishman at that time he wasn't used to this type of human contact but uh, I think he liked it and uh, this is how we started our life he came and he was living in our place for, uh, uh, from June to December when we got married he had a problem as well to um, to stay in Brazil. Yeah, uh, of course. When he came, he came on a on a, uh, on tourist, a tourist visa visa, and uh, he was allowed to stay two or three months the most, and then he he would have to go back to Brazil to England. And what we decided was to get married uh, officially. Civil wedding. Civil wedding uh, to to make uh, his all his documents to allow him to. Been to stay in Brazil because if he was married to a, a Brazilian woman, of course he was allowed to be, to be to live there. So we got married on the twenty sixth of October, the civil wedding, and uh, from then he started to make all the documentation for him to to stay in Brazil, and we got married on the twenty sixth of December. Religio the religious. So as soon as Bernie arrived in, in Brazil. Obviously, he was looking for a job. And uh, fortunately, uh, Simone, my friend, she found him, she found him this job in, uh, as a school, as a photographer teacher in the, the American school, rated school. So he started to work there. And uh, he worked there for two years earning very little, of course, and because he was earning little, he took odd jobs, uh, freelance photography, and, uh, for, uh, taking pictures of American families, and then eventually he got in touch with more and more American people, contact in, at, at the American consulate, and he took a lot of pictures for them, and, and little by little he was more working more and more as a freelance and um, so when he left uh, graded school we decided to open uh, uh, our first studio so we opened the first studio in at uh, Rua Pamplona uh, fourth, uh, on the floor. fourth floor we didn't even have a telephone so he, 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 we used my parents telephone as a basic uh, telephone for business and he had a beep, beepy at the time it was a I don't know a device that people used to call and he, he used to receive a, 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 a signal and then this meant that someone was uh, calling him and he called my parents and he got the message right 
I think this you, is... Yeah, call the centre. You call, 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 you call the, the centre center and people leave the message call there. Call the centre and then... He Doctors the used message. to use these. Right. Uh, it was the cell phone at the time. Sort of. Sort of. And um, so we had this uh, small studio with one employee, Elisette, for two years. And then um, we decided in 81, end of 81, to open up a shop, a proper shop. And we opened our shop in Pamplona, to cro uh, with Batatais, Pamplona with Batatais, where Philip lives now. And uh, it wasn't very easy at the time because by then we had uh, Deb Debbie and, and Philip were born already, and um, so I had uh, the house, uh, two children to look after, and the shop, and uh, we went on with the with all this, the, the the work from the studio. You know, taking pictures of um, uh, families, family pictures, and things mm, like that. Weddings this. and. Weddings, bar mitzvah, social events. So we were really, really busy. I woke up at five o'clock in the morning and went to bed at midnight. This was really the, my working hours. Uh, I tried to be with the kids when they were not at school. So I went to the shop. If they studied in the morning, I went to the shop. In the morning, if they studied in the afternoon period, because in Brazil you can do this, we I used to to work in the afternoon. And then, uh, by the end of eight, uh, after one year, uh, Stephanie was born, and um, I decided to take a, a, a sort of a leave for one year. So we uh, we hired a, a, a manage a manageress. Elizabeth. 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 And uh, so for one year I was looking. I was at looking after Stephanie, but uh, I still wa uh, was involved because we had uh, the school pictures. That's we started. Yeah. Uh, we had started, and uh, this really was uh, a busy period when we took pictures from the school and we had to organize all the selling and all the this was really really big and this lasted until when we eventually retired eventually philip when he was 13 or 14 he decided he wanted to uh, uh, travel to, to go to england and spend some time with his grandparents so he's, he wanted to um, have his own money so after the, the bar mitzvah, he realized he had uh, received quite a, a sum of, of money from the presents, and he needed more to do this trip. So he decided he asked his father if he could work for him, and, and of course he did. Bernie took him. He was uh, helping with the, the flash. He was holding. Basically, he was holding the flash. Uh, he was a slave, a slave. A slave. <laughs> and uh, so this is how he started. And he didn't, even though he made his money and he traveled, he, when he came back, he, he still got involved with, with uh, Bernie's work, eventually uh, filming. And uh, then he, he took uh, his university course, uh, uh, radio and television. And... Um, this is how he started to, he came here, he came to, to England for about nine months. He was filming for weddings. He was filming for an Egyptian guy, actually. And um, so this is how he started. Is he? he did courses, he did many things. And when he came back, he eventually opened his, uh, his, his own business. Debbie... Uh, she went to university. She was, she went to, she did the psychology course, and then she get, she got specialized. Uh, she got uh, 
all the courses after university. She did her and she did her masters. Her masters and and uh, she really enjoyed and she was very happy being a, a psychologist. Stephanie, she went for um, hotel management and uh, eventually she was working in hotels which she didn't like very much and eventually she changed she went to uh, events through philip through friends of philip she got a very good job as, uh, uh, doing events and uh, eventually she decided to spend uh, sometimes in england as well like uh, philip did learn english and she came she went to to england and eventually she stayed she didn't want to come back to brazil this was 2007. Debbie married in 2000 nelson and uh, philip married lucilla in 2005. stephanie married daniel 2017 in england and we all came and, and, and that, that's it, we were, the kids were all mar were, were married and didn't depend on us anymore. And this is when we started of uh, uh, changing our style of life. You know, from a, we had a big house, four bedroom house, 240 square meters house, this garden, three stories, and uh, a beautiful house, but a lot of expenses. So. We decided to change for a, to move for a smaller apartment in the same street. Two thousand in two thousand and thirteen, I got my my pension from the government, and uh, in two thousand and fifteen, Bernie got his pension from the government. We decided that it was time to close the the studio. In two thousand and fifteen, we decided it was time to close the the the, the business and and leave only on our pension, which we could have, but uh, we had a very, very good emplo employee, uh, Kelly. She really became part of the family. She worked with us for, she had been working with us for eight years, and uh, she got more and more involved in the, in the school photography, the school business. She was a good employee. And then she, uh, she said, instead of closing completely the business, we would close the, the studio and, and keep the photography, the school photography on uh, through, uh, by uh, working at home. So we worked, uh, Bernie were working in, in our place and she was working in her place. The only thing they had to do is to take the pictures at the schools and all the rest was done at home. And uh, so I agreed, as long as I wasn't very much involved, because I really wanted to stop working. So uh, my, 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 uh, my job was to organize the school pictures, which was easy, and uh, the rest was on them. We came to, to England several times to visit um, Stephanie, and, and eventually, we started uh, thinking about uh, moving. By then, my parents-in-law had uh, passed away, and they uh, they had an apartment in a flat in Bournemouth. And this flat was uh, we couldn't sell the flat when they died, so it was being rented. And then we started to think about considering the idea of moving to Bournemouth and, and living in this flat, buying the, the half of the flat, which was my brother-in-law, Joel. Uh, the, my, when my parents-in-law died, they left this flat for the two brothers. So eventually we bought his part and uh, we started thinking very uh, seriously about moving. And uh, so this was the uh, end of 2018. And uh, we came here in, in October. We, we saw the apartment, we saw the flat, and, and we started really uh, to take this move. 
and in the March of 2019 we we moved to um, to Bournemouth. And you're happy here? Very happy. <laughs>